Okay, if you're doing a leg press exercise on a shuttle or a leg press machine in the gym, the most important thing is to get the feet in the right position on the foot plate. If the feet were put too low, as in this position, I now can't see my toes because my knees are obscuring the view. This, due to the tightness in my calf muscles, the soleus and the Achilles tendon, will mean that I want to raise my heels off the foot plate, putting pressure through the ball of the foot, which then transfers pressure to the patella tendon. To overcome the tightness of the calves, and hence get the pressure on the sole of the foot to be through the heels and the outer border of the foot, we raise the feet, as I've done here. The feet width the part should be parallel to the hips, so the legs fall perpendicularly from the hips. The toes should remain relaxed, and then we push out like so. Now some people may mention to you that you shouldn't straighten your knees fully. I think it's essential that the legs are fully extended, but obviously what we do want to avoid is a snapping of the legs like so at the end of range where we lose control. When we come out of full extension, we need to make sure that the control is there. Again, anyone with a sore knee will probably find that their knee will want to flex quickly and drop suddenly like so. What we're looking for with a bilateral leg press is a smooth, controlled flexion of the knees or bend, keeping the alignment correct. And I would suggest you go down to 90 degrees where the thighs are now perpendicular to the ceiling. Push out fully and search out full extension. So this would be the sort of rate and the speed of which I would suggest the exercise is done. You see as I extend the knees there, there's a momentary hold and as I come out of extension it's smooth and controlled. Now the single leg exercise means that we don't change the position of the feet. Basically we take one foot down and if you have one leg that's obviously the, the problem leg, it's best to do the opposite leg, the good leg first, so that you're aware of what the exercise is going to feel like. So my stronger leg is my right leg, so I take the left one away. Again, the exercise is exactly the same. We're concentrating on this idea of alignment, where if there was a line that would bisect my thigh and cut the kneecap in half, and then continue down to the foot, that line should hit the junction between the second and third toe. So obviously if my knee drifts inwards, I'm going to lose my alignment. That will end up putting pressure on the medial aspect of the foot, which is not desirable. We want the pressure and the emphasis of pressure on the foot to be through the heel and through the lateral border of the foot. We start from a fully extended position, control the initial flexion, and usually I suggest we bend to about 60 degrees. My toes are still relaxed and by wriggling them in my shoe I can tell that that's the case. And then I fully extend. You'll probably notice that the eccentric component, the bending of the knee, is done slightly slower than the initiation of the concentric or the pushing outwards phase. And this obviously, the eccentric bending phase coincides with a landing from a jump, but also the concentric phase is related to pushing off and jumping upwards. So that's obviously going to be more dynamic. Usually we suggest that per set, you do probably about six repetitions of the unilateral exercise and then change to the opposite leg this doesn't restrict how many sets you do, but it's worthwhile keeping the reps to a, a minimum or a maximum of six so that we can then maintain good technique and not lose control of the exercise through boredom by having to do too many repetitions per set. Now from this position, this angle, you can see that if my feet were placed on the foot plate like they are now, my knees are actually higher than my toes 
I can't actually see my toes from this position, so that's a, another good clue that my legs are in the wrong position on the foot plate. So again, I would raise the feet to this high position that would allow me to push through the heels. Again, from the angle you're looking at now, you can see that the knees are parallel to the feet, which are also in the same series with the hips. I'm now going to press out, and you can see the exercise now as it looks from behind. So this is obviously going down to about 90 degrees. Again, the thighs are perpendicular, and making sure we control the extension. This view that you're looking at now really focuses on the alignment of the exercise. If we go straight into the single leg, you can see that if I was to lose the control at the hip and allow the thigh to immediately rotate, then as I was to bend, this would be an awful position, causing a pronatory force on the ankle and foot. In other words, I'd be loading heavily on the medial board of the foot, and this would be a, a type of alignment we would see with people that have poor control around the hip. So we correct that by making sure that we laterally rotate the thigh, getting good alignment between the thigh, the shin and the foot. The toes are relaxed, down to 60 degrees, and guide into extension. Control as we come out. And that little quiver that you can see in my leg is just because I'm starting to struggle. So this would be an appropriate weight for me to work at because it's a challenge to me. Well, this is what we call prone position where we're now face down. This is a prone leg extension exercise. Um, with the previous exercise, we were weight bearing through the heel. This exercise, we're obviously weight bearing through the ball of the foot, here with my left leg on the foot plate. If you can do this exercise on whatever equipment you're using, it's important to make sure that the foot is in the correct alignment with the hip, not too high as this would be, and obviously not too low. We also want to make sure that we're in good alignment. I don't want my foot drifting too far medially or too far out to the side. So again, it should be in parallel series with the hip, knee and the foot. I'm holding on to the front of the machine here. The pelvic position is very important. Those people that have a habit of extending or ha who have a prominent lordotic curve here need to try and correct that and maintain a neutral spine by posterior pelvic tilting. And we will probably discuss this anyway. So that's just a reminder to make sure at the side view, you can see that there's a neutral pelvic position here and a neutral spine position for the lumbar spine, and that I'm not extending as I elongate the leg into hip extension. So the exercise would look like this. I press out from the foot, I point my toes, and I should be in a neutral spine position, not extending too much and not arching too much at the same time. The control is then with the leg from the foot plate, we don't let the machine come to rest and then drive out with that concentric pressure and control the eccentric maneuver backwards. And this will be a sort of correct rate for the exercise concentric phase there, pushing out is done more powerfully and the control on the eccentric bending phase. And rest. As you know we normally progress from the leg press or shuttle machine into this weight bearing position and go through the ball squat regime. So as we pointed out on the leg press machine, we raise the feet on the foot plate in order to keep the pressure on the heels and not through the balls of the feet. The equivalent position in this upright standing position is to walk the legs forward slightly rather than having them directly under your body. In this position here, as I flex my knees to squat, I've now lost sight of my toes. My knees are now traveling way over the fronts of my toes and because of the tightness in my soleus and my Achilles, this is forcing the pressure 
onto the ball of the foot, which makes this quite uncomfortable through the patella tendon. To avoid this, I can walk forwards to this point, where now I'm comfortably able to keep the weight through my heels, keep my toes relaxed. My feet, again, are going to be the similar width to that that they were on the leg press, i.e. they're going to drop perpendicularly from my hips. I don't want them too wide, and I certainly don't want them too narrow in this position. The exercise is done by putting the ball behind the thoracic spine, not too close to the lumbar spine, but again, you don't want the ball to end up around the back of your head and neck as you do your squat. So it's just finding that position that's comfortable. You can see that there's an equivalent amount of ball either side of my body, so I'm right in the middle of the ball. And as I squat, I sit into the squat in this way, so that my spine is vertical and that my weight is back and there is increased pressure against the ball in this seated position. More pressure than there is in this position. So my pressure against the ball now is less. As I go into the squat, I crush the ball against the wall and my knees stay back from my feet and I can view my toes at all times. The toes are still relaxed, even though the feet are flat on the floor, the actual pressure is predominantly through the heels and through the lateral board of the foot. In this position, we can also see that the alignment of my thigh in relation to the foot is good. I haven't allowed my knees to squint together and I haven't rolled out onto the outer borders of my feet too far, creating this bow leg position. So this will be the exercise to do five repetitions. We sit into the squat, go down to approximately 90 degrees, where now the thighs are parallel to the floor. Push up, fully straighten the legs with control. Down to 90, back up. Down to 90, back up. So again, the control is on the eccentric or bending phase. Slightly more power on the concentric phase, but still the control on the extension. I'll do for that, I think. Okay, the lateral view of this exercise allows you to see the position of the shin and the position of the lumbar spine. So as I squat down now, you can see that the shins are perpendicular to the floor, the lumbar spine is back, I'm not disappearing under the ball in this way, and I'm not coming away from the ball over here. Coming away from the ball in this way means now I can't see my toes, the knees have gone forwards over the feet, and that will put the pressure on the patella tendon and the anterior part of the knee joint. If I disappear under the ball, then I've lost control here, and that obviously is a poor position for the lumbar spine. So it's important that we find this vertical position to there. Back up. From this position you can see that the thighs are ending up parallel to the floor. I don't see any reason to go deeper into these sorts of positions. It's not a position you're going to push up from too often. It's only likely to put too much strain through the knee joint. But during your appointment, we probably talked about doing compound exercises where we combined upper body and the squat at the same time. So a shoulder press exercise could be to start with the dumbbells in this position, and as I go into the squat, I extend the arms above the head like so, and then return to that position as we extend the knees back. An alternative could be to start with the arms fully extended and as we squat the arms come down to the shoulders and as we drive up the arms drive up in sequence. Another alternative could be to combine the squat with an arm curl. We could also add the two exercises together, so the arm curl and the shoulder press. So we curl, press, curl, 
curl down and return to normal. So curl, press, down to the shoulders, return. We can do these in an asymmetrical fashion. So starting in this position and as you squat down, both arms come to the shoulders and then change as you straighten up. We could also add in a lateral exercise. Obviously you need to perhaps adjust the dumbbells for this because it's a smaller muscle group. We'll go down to this position here and back up. Could do one weight forwards and one weight to the side and then change. They're just some examples of upper body weights to combine with the squat. With the leg press exercise, we went from a bilateral um, exercise straight into a unilateral leg press. When we're dealing with the body weight, that may be too big a jump for most people recovering from injury or following an operation. So as an intermediate sort of exercise, we go from doing a bilateral squat, as we just looked at, into a lunge position. The lunge position places more emphasis on the forward leg. The rear leg is there just really for stabilization. It's important with the lunge that we see that there is a width between the feet, just as we have here. What we don't want to do is to end up with a position where we're almost balancing on a tightrope, because that's not functional to do so. So the leg should go back behind us in line with the hip. The forward leg is also in line with the hip. And in this position, we would then drop into our lunge. All the principles we've talked about, about weight-bearing surface of the foot, the position of the knee in relation to the foot, the alignment of the thigh in relation to the foot, all remain the same. The degree of bend is really, again, to the point where the thigh comes parallel to the floor. The rear knee should bend, but shouldn't touch the floor. With the arms, we're starting to bring in this reciprocal pattern of moving the arm, or the opposite arm, with the leg that's <coughs> forwards, just as we would with normal walking and running. It's quite normal to feel a pulling, straining sensation on the rear leg, because this position is a nice stretch for the thigh of my right leg. The next stage of this group of exercises is, whereas then we were just in a lunge position, this time we drop into a lunge position. So we're adding movement, which therefore means we need more control. So I'm going to step back with my left leg into a lunge, therefore my left arm will stay forwards as the right leg is forwards. So we drop, and as we extend the right knee, we come back to standing making sure we keep that alignment that we talked about. Again, the forward leg is the working leg. It's controlling the bend and it's producing the power to straighten up. The final one of the three is to do a kicking action. We start in a lunge position. and This is really important now that we maintain a pressure from the forward heel backwards into the ball. If at any stage I don't produce that force pushing myself back onto the ball, there's a danger the ball will fall away and I potentially could smash my head against the wall. So as you go to kick with your right leg and straighten this knee, you're going to keep the force pressing backwards all the time from in this case my left heel. So the action would look like so. Straighten up and kick drop into the lunge. Note the arms follow the same pattern as they would if you were kicking a ball. So drive, kick, drive, kick. So I'm straightening my left leg as I swing through to kick, but I'm keeping that backward pressure all the time. Dropping into the lunge, swinging through. We've adopted a bigger ball for this exercise to give me the option of doing a wider lunge stance so my foot's not smashing against the skirting board every time. 
and that completes those three exercises. So when you've attended for your appointment, we've probably talked about progressions. I've now put the green elastics around my ankles. These are particularly useful for when we do the second of the previous three exercises, dropping back into the lunge. It's obviously making it more difficult to control the position. So as we watch now, drop back. So I'm dropping into the lunge and having to work against the resistance of the bands. Obviously the bands facilitate and help the leg return, but also they make it difficult for the right leg to step back. The final of those three exercises was the kicking action. And this is particularly useful to put the resistance on, but makes it even more paramount that you keep that pressure back against the ball. Because obviously now you're kicking against the resistance, the tendency is to pull you away from the wall, and therefore lose that compression of the ball against the wall and potentially fall backwards. So we start in the lunge position as we are here and I'm going to kick through and straighten. Drop into lunge, kick, straighten. Obviously if you had a person working with you they could be aiming a ball at your foot, redirecting it so you could kick across kick forwards, kick across and change the position. We're moving on to the single leg squat now, which is obviously a great exercise to do. Very, very important for lower limb alignment. And hopefully now you've got to the stage of your rehab where you're strong enough to do this work and can get good control. People talk about how many reps and sets should you do if somebody's working with you, really they should be watching to see when you start to fail, when the quality of the exercise is lost. If you're working on your own, either on the shuttle or with any of these exercises in an upright position, as a general rule, keep the repetitions down to six when you're doing unilateral single leg work, but do as many sets as you feel comfortable doing. So it's common for me to give people 10 sets of six um, so in other words, we're doing 60 single leg squats all together. Now if we'd adopted a position like this for a bilateral squat, and I was dropping to there, the only change I would make for the single leg squat is to walk my feet backwards. I don't bring them any closer together, and I didn't point this out on the shuttle, but one thing you mustn't do with a single leg, uh, leg press or squat is then be keen to put the leg in the middle because now you'll see from the camera position that my foot is now well inside my groin and this is not a good position there's a, a valgus or internal rotation position at the right knee and there's a tendency for me to pronate this foot to get good alignment we want the legs to fall as we've mentioned before perpendicularly from the pelvis the weight bane wants to be on the heel predominantly on the outer border of the foot now for me to get onto a single leg exercise I now want to transfer my weight over to the right. And it's important that my torso stays parallel to the surface facing me. So I don't want any rotation of myself on the ball to occur. So I'm going to slide sideways, keeping my body in the same alignment to get this position. Now I'm noticing that obviously I'm weight bearing through my right foot, but the predominance of pressure on the ball is through the left side of my body. The right side of my body is now not touching the ball here. Now the exercise is as we did for the bilateral squat, but as we did also on the shuttle, we don't bend as far when we go to a single leg squat. So you'll see now that I bend to about 60 degrees, but the control is there, the knee stays back from the foot, so I'm sitting back onto my heel. I'm making sure that I get that full knee extension in a controlled manner, and that the rate of the movement is smooth and consistent throughout. If you're having a little difficulty controlling your body position on the ball, you can use your elbows to grip the ball a little bit like so, and that can add a little bit of stability in the early stages, but as you progress, obviously the less support you give yourself, the better, so that you're having to provide that control from the foot and the lower limb position. Then if I transfer to the left side, feet go back into a position that would be appropriate for a bilateral squat, then I transfer my weight onto the left, keeping my torso in the same plane, 
and I sit back onto the left side. Fully straighten. Again, there's a slight emphasis of pressure more to the heel and on the outer border of the foot. You can see the knee is not losing its position in relation to the lower limb or foot. The alignment is good throughout the exercise. And with a bilateral squat facing the wall, again, we call this position prone. The ball rests on the stomach rather than upon the chest as we've done with the other exercises. So it's much further down on the stomach. The feet are away from the wall with the predominance of pressure now being on the ball of the foot with the heels just slightly raised off the floor. The feet are again the same width as the legs are at the hips, not too wide, not too narrow. You lean forwards so that you're a straight line from the heels up to the head and neck. The hands shadow the wall in this position don't touch it for balance, but hold just off, just in case you need to have them there, in case the ball should slip or your feet slip. It's important to make sure that you've got a good purchase between your feet on whatever surface you're on. This floor is sometimes a bit slippy. Carpet tiles tend to be much better for gripping on. We also have to be careful that the heels don't start to drift in like this or out in this way as we do the exercise, so you need to be aware of that. And the knees also need to track in line with the feet as you do the exercise. Now as I go down into the squat, that's the eccentric phase of the exercise, and that's the control phase, similarly to landing from a jump. So I keep the forward pressure on the ball as I go forwards, and the ball approaches my chin, that tells me that I've gone far enough down, and I'm ready to drive up in the concentric phase, or the shortening phase, the power phase. So again, control on the eccentric component, keep the forward pressure almost to my chin and drive up. That's the bilateral exercise. To go to a unilateral exercise, all we do is walk the feet forward to Tad, keep the same width between the feet, and as we did with the previous single leg squat, we move across like so, keeping my torso parallel to the wall. The pressure is now through the right foot, but the pressure on the ball is definitely through the left hip. There is no pressure on the ball from the right hip. Again, the arms cover the wall. And again, as we've done with single leg work to date, we don't squat quite as far. So we keep the control, keep the forward lean, and drive up. Initially, when you do the exercise, you'll need to do the concentric and eccentric phase at the same pace to keep the control. But as you get a bit more confident, the eccentric lowering phase will be done slowly and then you can drive up quickly with the concentric phase for power. Right, we're moving on to the lateral squat now. The position of the ball is the biggest problem with this exercise for most people. Due to the years that I've done this exercise, I'm fortunate usually to find the correct position and that's usually around the pocket area of your tracksuit or shorts as in this case. The free arm, my left arm in this case, hovers just above the ball at sort of a, a parallel angle from my shoulder and that's the gauge as to how far down I want to go. When the underside of my arm comes close to the ball, that's the degree of bend which I'm desiring. The double leg exercise is with the feet together and the position of the feet in relation to the wall is important. Here we have the feet at an angle of 45 degrees. Now we can use the tiles on the floor here which obviously have right angles in them, so therefore we know if we're in line with the diagonal on the tile, we know we're at 45 degrees. So that may be a, a point you can use wherever you're doing the exercise, but generally speaking, we don't want the feet parallel to the wall, and we don't want the feet perpendicular to the wall, like so, we want them at 45 degrees in that position. With the exercise, again, the emphasis is to put the weight through the heels. So if I squat in this position, I'm going to sit back like so, so my toes can still wriggle and my knees are still back from my toes. So I'm not reaching forwards and ending up with pressure on the ball of the foot. Now, most people at this stage of this rehab process don't really require the bilateral exercise. So we'll go straight to the unilateral exercise. The left leg, now doing this, is a nice position because it very much mimics the position of the planting leg before somebody strikes a ball. So you've got this pronated position of the foot and ankle. 
the valgus position of the knee dropping in, putting a stress on the medial ligament. So this exercise is a great lower limb exercise for post-ankle instability, post-ankle fracture, ligament problems, ligament problems around the knee. It's generally a great exercise. My body's leaning definitely into the ball. I'm not bowing away from the ball. So I'm leaning into the ball. Pressure again is predominantly on the heel. And as with any unilateral exercise, we don't bend quite as far as we did on the bilateral. So I sit into the squat. The underside of my arm is just coming into contact with the ball. That tells me that's far enough. And again, we probably do six repetitions per set. In this position, we then change to the right leg. So now there's definitely a lateral stability component to this exercise, whereas the previous one was more medial. So my lateral ligament is going to be strained at the ankle, the lateral complex at the knee, and the hip structures laterally are going to be working hard. Here again, keep the pressure on the heel, and we're now going to keep the lean into the ball and drop onto the heel that way. So the hips are dropping behind the leg in this position, not forwards. That stops us from putting pressure on the ball of the foot. And again, this arm position can help us gauge how far down to go. It goes without saying that the opposite way around would be just to move into this position. Again, the feet are at 45 degrees. So now we do the medial component of the right leg, like so. And we do the lateral component of the left leg, like so. Well, moving on to the step up. I start the step up regime with here my right foot on top of the step. The left arm is going to be forwards in this reciprocal pattern as we've done before. You can see that the knee alignment is good. The pressure is directly down over the step. We don't want to be pushing forwards because we might lose stability with the steps. You have to make sure you regard safety as a key thing with all these exercises first of all. What we're going to do is go straight into a, a step up with what we call a hip drive. So the idea is to challenge this leg that's weight bearing on the step and make sure that it can balance fully with single leg standing. The arms change as the legs change. So I'm going to step through into this tall position. Now the key thing that people do wrong here is that they don't fully extend the standing leg. And maybe they also don't control their balance. So this knee has come up to parallel to my waist and as I step down from this position I want to step down and backwards. So this is the eccentric phase of the exercise where the control is needed by the quadriceps on the right leg. So I step back with control, not just flopping down. Now if you were to lose your balance on this exercise, the key thing is to try and fight it and not bail out. Try and control your balance as much as possible and you should not move until you're ready to move, until you can show that you've got control. Then you can step back. And as you get more confident, you can step up with more dynamic yeah, steps. In other words, the concentric phase of the step like can be more powerful, because like that, that would okay. obviously lead into a jump. So step up quicker and step down. The arms will govern the speed of the legs. You can't do a, a quick step and have lethargic arms working. So drive up, hold, and step down. Drive up, hold, and step down. Ready? Okay, from this position, what I wanted to show was that sometimes when people stand up fully, they end up leaning backwards, which is not a good position. So the position we want is to be forwards, but tall from the hips here, not arching back and leaning back in this position. We also, from this position, get an idea of whether the knee is fully extended. A lot of people feel that this position is full extension of the right leg, when really there is still that degree of extension to find. And that's really important because our quadriceps don't relax in standing unless we're in full extension. That would mean that we put a lot of pressure onto the patellofemoral joint and a number of patients that will be using this DVD will be patients that have come with patellofemoral problems. So the idea of the exercise is to step up, control the balance. And if you lose balance, it's not a problem. What you're trying to do is make sure that you fight it and that you control your balance. Right, 
Right, we're now moving on to dynamic lunges. You see the start position is with my feet directly under my hips. And this is important because as people step forward with the lunge, they often lose this width between the two feet and end up wondering why they're losing their balance. And it's usually because they've adopted a position that looks more like they're on a tightrope. So what we don't want is to step my right leg in front of my left and then be in this position for the lunge because we're losing this lower limb alignment that we've harped on about so much to date. So as I step forward with my right leg, it should step forwards in line with the position of the foot now and not deviate medially or laterally. If you have lines on your floor, as we do here with the tiles, use them as a reference point to help your positioning of the foot as you step forwards. Now with a lunge, you're going to step with forward momentum. This means that often the weight goes forwards too far onto the front leg and the knee can end up deviating right over the top of the foot, putting pressure on the ball of the foot and therefore putting a lot of painful soreness through that front of the knee. What I always suggest to people is that you step forwards with the heel predominantly, so in this position, there. So now we can see that my knee's well back from my toe, the foot and knee are in good alignment. I've stepped forwards with my left arm forwards and my right leg. My body's tall and independent. I haven't ended up leaning forwards like this with the knee going to this position. I've kept it back. The rear leg is bent, which we'll look at in a moment from a lateral view. And now from this position, I drive up into standing and have to control my balance. So this leg that was weight bearing in the forward position is now single leg standing and now I'm ready to step forward with my left leg and my right arm into the next lunge which is there. So again I don't move until I've got absolute control. So I can push up from the left side, get my balance, hold, step forwards with my right. Push up, hold and so on. The lateral view of the lunge is very important because it gives us this position of the shin and also the shin on the rear leg. So if I step forwards into a right lunge, there we can see a good position for a lunge in that my knee is well back from my toe, the shin falls vertically from the knee, my body's upright, the rear leg is bent at the knee, so I'm getting a nice thigh stretch through this left thigh, and the shin of my rear leg is usually parallel to the floor. The left arm is forwards, and the movement into an upright standing position on my right leg will be like so. Step up to here. As a general rule, I would suggest that per set of lunges, um, eight is probably a good number to do. We're generally going to give you three sets of lunges to do, three different exercises. We've already covered the first one. As an alternative, we now do a lunge that involves a little bit more control and a little bit more movement. So I start in this position, hip flexion on the left, right arm forwards as my left leg is raised. I'm now in this single leg standing position, going to rotate my left leg outwards to about 45 degrees. I do that without moving my torso, and then the torso then follows the leg, and then I lunge in that 45 degree direction, pivoting on the rear toe. You see the difficulty in balance there, especially if you do it particularly slowly. Now from this position, I drive up into single leg standing. It's really fight hard to get my balance there. Got the control. Now this leg now rotates to 45 degrees. The body then follows and I lunge into that position. Drive up, fight the balance, difficult there. Hold that position, get my right knee straight good control, good weight bearing alignment through the hips, rotate the leg out 45 degrees, the torso follows and then lunge with control into that position. Drive up again, rotate the leg, rotate the torso and lunge and pivot on the rear foot. Okay, the final lunge exercise, so that it doesn't become too monotonous, is to rotate the torso towards the side of the forward leg. So I'm going to step forward with my left leg, this side, and I'm going to rotate my torso to the left side in conjunction with that forward step. This is really important now that the feet keep the, the width that we've talked about earlier. If you end up being one leg in front of the other, it's very, very difficult to maintain balance and it's also poor alignment. So it's particularly important 
So keep the legs a normal width apart, and if you don't, it will probably be the reason why you're losing your balance. So I'm going to step forward with the left leg and rotate to the left side in that way. Then I push up from the left leg into a straight position, fight the balance, hold that position there, right leg's up, I'm going to step forwards into a right lunge and rotate to the right side. Step and rotate. Push up through the right side, single leg stance, having to fight my balance there, but I didn't bail out, kept balance, and then step forwards and rotate at the same time. Right, we're now moving on to some calf exercises on the leg press here. The initial push out is obviously through both legs, as we did with the quad exercises earlier. Push out, and then we walk the feet down to the bottom of the foot plate. It's really important from a safety point of view to make sure you've got enough of your foot on the foot plate. We don't want to be just on the toes where there's a danger you could slip and fall off. So get the full ball of the foot on the foot plate. Now we, we know from research that's been done that the eccentric component of exercises is really therapeutic for tendons. So what we're going to do here is do the concentric component using both feet. So in other words, if you had a sore Achilles or a sore calf, you would assist in the concentric component of the exercise using your good leg to, as a splint or a support for the bad one, like so. So we go up into this calf raise position with the knees in extension. We would then attempt to transfer the weight to the sore side, which in my case is the right. And then we slowly, eccentrically lower down from the ankle using the calf power to control the descent and we can see that the heel has gone well below the level of the foot or the ball of the foot. So we've got this good active stretch of the gastrocnemius and calf complex. The knee has stayed straight throughout. The concentric phase again is done through both sides and then again the eccentric phase is done through the affected or injured side. And we obviously want to make that eccentric phase as slow and as smooth and as controlled. And usually we put in a nice sustained hold at the bottom here where we try and relax the ankle and let the heel assume as low a position as possible to get the maximum stretch. If the knee was uncomfortable at any stage in this, anteriorly at the front, it could be that you're getting a bit of an impingement, so it would be quite okay just to flex the knee slightly when you do this exercise. Now the next exercise is done very similarly, but what we do is we go up on both, as we did before, we flex the knee slightly on the affected side. This exercise is now going to target the soleus muscle, which is lower down, and the Achilles tendon, not so much the gastrocnemius muscle, the big calf muscle. So now we just lower down from the ankle and we keep the bend that we've applied to the knee consistent throughout. So this is a real coordination exercise to try and maintain the knee position as we lower down from the ankle. So we go up again, make sure the knee stays flexed to the degree that we desire, and then lower down from the ankle, keeping the knee as consistent as possible. The final of the three exercises we like to do is to adopt a similar position to that that we did just now. So the heel is down and the knee is flexed, and now, as we point the toes, we also very dynamically straighten the knee. So this is the real power exercise, as if you were pushing off for a jump or pushing off to sprint. So I drive off like so. So plantar flexion, pointing the toes, is combined with knee extension. And then as we dorsiflex the foot and lower the heel, the knee is allowed to flex to about 20, 30 degrees. And then we drive up again, pushing out. Now with the initial exercises, i.e. the one with the straight leg, we assisted the affected leg with the unaffected leg. So we went up in the concentric phase using two. Once we get over the initial problem phase of the calf or Achilles problem, you'll be able to do that concentric phase on the one side, and then the eccentric phase would just be at the slower lowering down. Ideally the concentric phase is the power phase, the more dynamic movement, and the eccentric control is much slower. And that would go for all the exercises we've just looked at. So again, the soleus exercise, 
with the knee staying in the flex position would look like so. That's the plantar flexion with the knee flexed and now the dorsiflexion with the knee staying consistent. This is a really nice ankle mobilization exercise to do because it's very specific to the ankle complex. Now some of you may not have access to a leg press and if you have a calf problem at home or an ankle problem you can obviously adapt the exercises we've just done on the shuttle to doing them on a normal step here. So the exercise would look just like so. So we raise up bilaterally on both calves. So in other words we're supporting the affected side with the unaffected one. And then you can use the wall or whatever is around for support and then lower down slowly, eccentrically and allow the heel to drop below the height of the step and get that extra stretch through the calf complex here. Again, the concentric phase, which could be the damaging phase in the early stages of an injury process or an injury healing process, is done by both. Transferred weight onto the affected side and then keeping the knee straight, lower down smoothly and slowly and then just sustain that stretch at the bottom. The exercise we showed with the knee held in slight flexion can also be done. So we now flex the left knee slightly or bend it. And now we keep that knee bend the same, but just work from the heel. And the final stage of those exercises was to transfer the weight onto the one side with the knee flexed and then drive up from this dorsiflexed ankle position with the knee flexion so we do both extension exercises together. So we push off in that way, which is the power exercise for jumping or sprinting. Drop back down to that flex knee position, low ankle position, drive up again. So the concentric position of driving up, or the movement is very powerful there, very forceful. The eccentric component should be slow and controlled. The single leg exercise can also be done for the one we, we keep the knee consistently bent. So we just work from the ankle there and lower down slowly. On this exercise, the concentric component, as in the pushing up, can't really be done quickly because if it is, you'll lose that position of knee flexion. And again, that's the one that's the terrific ankle mobilizing exercise. 